speakers this evening. Um, John Frommeyer is going to uh, speak on the perfect catch of philosophy of virology. He's teaching a course on that in the Honors College uh, this particular term. Um, and he's author of a book uh, that's in manuscript form. Uh, it's a wonderful book. Uh, uh, when it gets to where it needs to be, um, it's really a delightful read. And uh, John has been gracious to share a little bit with, uh, of that with me. Um, already. He's uh, just briefly he earned his undergraduate degree from Stanford and a master's degree in uh, Christian ethics um, from the University of Chicago and then went to the school down south to earn his uh, degree in law at the uh, U of a law school. Um, he was uh, a member of the U.S. Navy and he also chaired the Oregon Arts Commission from 1980 to 1984. Uh, his uh, most public uh, profile was really when he served as, uh, uh, when he was appointed by George uh, Herbert Walker Bush to be the chair of the National Endowment for the Arts in 1989, a uh, very significant time frame uh, in this country, sort of what was is often referred to as the initiation of the culture wars. Um, and so he served there for three years because of some of the controversies. Uh, he, uh, uh, we were asked to resign, I guess is how Fired! <laughs> this is how, how, how the Wikipedia page puts it, is asked to resign. Uh, he's published two books, uh, Leaving Town Alive, uh, which is about uh, his experience with the uh, National Endowment for the Arts, and Out of Time, Listening to the First Amendment. Um, and yeah, he's uh, currently teaching an honors college course. Um, so John's on, if you have a guess, John's on the um, my far left, which is where he is politically, um, is, is, one of the, is on your right. Thank you, Courtney. <clears throat> well, the uh, Mark Twain was quipped that heaven is by favor, not by merit. If it were by merit, your dog would get in and you would not. <laughs> But I believe that knowledge is kinetic, and love is kinetic, and probably religion is Connecticut. Connecticut. <laughs> yes. No, no, no religion, Connecticut. Um, <clears throat> so why not approach them through activity? Um, Roology, which is my sort of tongue-in-cheek uh, group of of ideas, uh, it's, it's not a, a school of theology, it's not a school of anything, let alone a school of fish, but it does kind of give my sense of what rowing has to do with the whole spiritual side of life. And there are eight of these points, which I'll go through quite quickly. Uh, the first is efficiency. And efficiency, as far as rowing is concerned, is getting the maximum out of every stroke um, and that is in what we in, in rowing what we call length. That means you get your oar in as far to the bow of the boat as you can, and it doesn't come out of the water until your body is fully extended back. And that gives the maximum power uh, for every stroke, which is was, is efficiency. In terms of life, uh, efficiency is getting the maximum out of every day, helping to yourself to plan so that you don't. Um, waste time, that, and, and from a college standpoint, not getting blitzed every weekend so you don't wake up until 4 o'clock on Sunday afternoon. I mean, those are the sorts of things that efficiency is about as far as rheology is concerned. The second is steadfastness. It's kind of a biblical term, um, but steadfastness in, in my universe here is mutual dependency. Um, in rowing, if you're rowing in an eight, either everybody gets a medal or nobody gets a medal. And one of the things that you learn in the sport is that you really are dependent upon each other. You learn to trust each other. You know that everybody else in that boat is working as hard as you are and that ultimately your success is not an individual success. Nobody can row the boat all by themselves. It is a communal sort of idea and certainly one of the things about religion, every religion I know, it is, it is a communal activity as well, a, a fellowship of, of, of believers. Courage is number three on the list in rheology. Um, Aristotle talked about courage as being a virtue, uh, but to have courage you had to 
avoid the two vices that are sort of on either side of courage. The one vice being cowardice, where you don't suit up. Um, and the other being foolhardiness, where you don't pay attention to the ordinary dangers of whatever it is that you're engaging in. So the median there, the mean, as far as Aristotle was concerned, is where courage lives. The fourth is being an amateur, doing it for the love of the activity, as opposed to doing it because you have to do it, doing it because you're getting paid for it, doing it because somebody told you to do it. Uh, it's a totally voluntary sort of thing. And, and I think you will find uh, amongst the, the, the people who row that there is no more dedicated group of people to the activity. And, and so you go to a regatta and although you're going to race against these people and you're going to beat them, um, you're, it, everybody is, is, is friendly and after the races you're congratulating the people in the other boats and it's, it's just really quite different from society as a whole where everybody is basically ready to punch out everybody else. <laughs> Next is transcendence or spirituality or otherness if you will. I mean, there's nothing quite so sublime in my view as being out in a single skull early in the morning when the mist is rising off the river and the herons are out there and the beavers are out there and the ducks are out there and you're by yourself on the river and it is really as close to a spiritual ascendance as anything that uh, I've experienced in religion or otherwise. Um, and, it, and there's something about that that's so, so totally renewing um, that I can't believe that there's not something spiritual about the bodily activity that's going on there in the row. Self-knowledge is six. Self-knowledge is, in my view, the goal of all education. Um, but one of the things that you find out in rowing, and particularly if you race, is that the limitations that we set on ourselves are artificial. And every coach knows this. Every coach will make you do more than you think you are capable of doing. Um, and that kind of uh, self-knowledge is, is really only gainable, in my view, if you press yourself. And so even if you're not athletic, even if you're not interested particularly in, in winning medals and, and the sort of foolishness that we do where we go across the country and spend a couple thousand dollars to hopefully win, to, win a 50 cent medal. <laughs> I think you should race because racing tells us something about ourselves. That's how we learn about ourselves. Celebration is number seven. Celebration because you love doing what you do. I mean, I think one of the things about religion um, that I most appreciated uh, when I was a believer was the celebration that religious, religion brings to our lives. Um, what I appreciated most about uh, religion was the liturgical part of it, and the liturgical part of most religions has a lot of celebration built into it. And finally, aesthetics. There is real beauty uh, in moving a craft across the water particularly with the kind of synchronization that you have in a multi-person boat. Um, and that kind of aesthetics is absolutely um, found in, 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 in every religion. Um, the celebration, the, the sense of thankfulness, the sense of gratitude for, for uh, a world that is really quite beautiful. So those are the eight sort of uh, arbitrary points in rowology, and I'd like to sort of segue into some points generally about, about rowing and, and theology. The first being that water is central to almost all religions. Um, certainly in the Christian religion you have uh, Noah and the flood, and no, Joan of Arc was not Noah's wife. And <laughs> <laughs> Secondly, you have baptism, which is the, the, both the renewal uh, in the Christian life and the, the sense of joining the, the Christian community. And you have um, 
what else? Moses <coughs> parting the Red Sea. There's lots of water in, in the Bible. In fact, I think that the, there's something like 365 references to water uh, in the Bible. Um, Hindus have sacred rivers. Uh, Islam, you, you bathe um, before handling the Quran, um, after sex, that sort of thing. So uh, there are incidences of, of water as both the sense of, of renewal of life and purification um, in, in almost all religions. The second, and this is, is philosophy generally, I think, but, but philosophy is thought that's aware of itself, but it's also thought that leads to action. In my view, philosophy, which simply kind of sits there in the, in the library and contemplates itself, is not philosophy that I'm very interested in. I'm in philo interested in philosophy that leads to doing something because we have thought about it and decided to do it. Um, and certainly in, in rowing, you have that kind of, uh, of uh, well, you have a lot of action. Um, so there is another connection. Um, both, I already said this, but, uh, but I, would, I would make it as a point again generally, both religion and sport require that you do more than you think you are capable of doing. Um, the injunction of Jesus uh, that uh, all things are possible uh, is certainly one in the New Testament. Um, and I think anybody who has rowed competitively um, understands that although you thought you were going to die at 300 meters, you can finish the race. <laughs> and you, you will finish the race because you owe it to your teammates. And you'd rather die before you would let them down. It's that so, sort of, sort of, uh, of, of uh, community. Uh, John Dewey said that learning really only happens after physical activity. Um, and I think one of, one of the things that, that physical activity does is it, it, it makes us receptive to learning, just like uh, the repetition in religion makes us susceptible to spirituality. Um, I, I'll give you an example of any spiritual song. If you ever, ever uh, attend a, a, a African American church, and you, and you hear the kind of repetition uh, uh, in, in all of the spirituals that they sing. There's something about that, that, that it's almost like an exciter and an electric motor, and it keeps going and it keeps going, oh, like, a, like, like uh, uh, saying Hail Marys or, or, or Rosary. Or uh, Once you do it enough, there's something about that that sort of brings on the receptivity to the spiritual. Um, being a steward of our bodies uh, is a, a point that I think is important both to rowing and to religion. Um, we're given one body. Uh, we have the option of uh, ignoring it, uh, mistreating it, uh, or honoring it. And I think one of the ways that we honor our bodies is to use them uh, constructively and athletically. Just a comment about life on the plateau. Um, probably 95, maybe 99 percent of our lives are, are lived on a, a plateau of sorts. Um, when you start a new sport, uh, you make huge gains. Um, and then you sort of plateau, and then you slide back a little bit, and if you keep at it, if you keep practicing and practicing and practicing at some point, but it's not clear when that point will be, you will get some gains. And then you'll slide back a little bit. And then you, you know, kind of keep practicing and pr practicing, and you say, why should I do this? The coach doesn't know my name, and I'm in the third boat with the shitbirds, and uh, you know, why am I doing this? But the point of it is that that's kind of what life is like. <laughs> You know, we, we, we have these, these great moments of, of excitement and accomplishment and, and energy, but for the most part, the real challenge in life is keeping it together when we're vacuuming the house or feeding the baby or studying in the library or 
doing whatever it is that every day requires us to do. And here again, I think that there are some real connections between um, rowing and religion. Um, the first is a heightened sense of awareness that when you're rowing, every stroke counts. And since 95 or 99% of your time is practicing, then you have to make every stroke as perfect a stroke as you can. And you think, well, God, I've done this stroke thousands, maybe billions of times, and how can I make You can. You can. And, and part of that is figuring out is, is concentration. But part of it is, is, is recognizing that even on the plateau, we can learn. And, and somehow, magically, and you've been out there for an hour, and all of a sudden, one stroke tells you something you didn't know. Maybe, and, and I, you know, I've rode for over 30 years, and it's amazing. You go out there and, oh, I didn't know that before. So that's one of the ways that we can live life on the plateau, is, is really being aware. And of course, one of the ways that you are aware in, in uh, religion is, is like daily devotions, even if it's only a few minutes but something that keeps you on track. The second is embracing practice. And, and uh, it's sort of what I've already said, except it's, it's going at it a little differently and, and, and recognizing that practice is, is part of the whole scheme of what it is that you're doing athletically. The third is constant assessment. Um, and the fourth is simply dedication, making this a part of your life that really matters. And then the final thing that I would, I would say uh, about rowing and, and religion <coughs> is attitude. You know, so much of, of what we accomplish or don't accomplish in life depends upon the attitude that we bring to it. Uh, Henry Ford said, those who think they can and those who think they can't are both right. Um, and I'm not talking about a Pollyanni-ish uh, Polly attitude. But the example I would use is the Nike slogan, just do it. Just do it is a, a perfect slogan in my mind because what you have done as you're sitting there at the starting line is you have practiced and you have erred in, on the, on the uh, rowing machines and you've been in the tank and you have, have run and you've done your jumpies and you've done your core exercises and you are ready. And all that's left to do is leave your mind at home and let your body do it. And it, it's, it's a curious thing to say, but in my experience, athletic success in rowing is almost directly related to not thinking during the race, to just letting your body do what it has been so superbly trained to do. And in a, in a real sense, I feel that that is spiritual. If you talk to a person who has really done well in a race, um, the chances are pretty good that she won't be able to tell you very much about the body of that race. You know, the race started, and with 50 meters to go, we had open water on the next boat. I mean, you know, that's, that's about what you're going to remember because your body has done it and, and your mind, thankfully, uh, has been on vacation. <laughs> and uh, th there's a wonderful book by Six Cent Mahali, uh, totally unpronounceable name, uh, called Flow, uh, which describes this phenomenon where it's almost an out of body kind of experience um, that you, know, you get in, in, in a lot of different, different circumstances. Uh, but certainly if your boat has what, what, what we call swing, that sort of magical thing where everybody is totally in sync with everybody else, that's flow. And that is uh, an out-of-body, uh, a spiritual kind of experience. Mm -hmm.